over the plan five times. I got the package, didn't I? We need a pickup. Hang on. Grab the light. This is the top team. The rogue clones on the run from the Empire, huh? Hello. How juicy. The Empire's growing stronger. We should be doing more. You want to really be free? Then pull off this heist, and you can have a future. Rumors are more and more clones have been questioning the Order. Then they are traitors, like the Jedi. You all gave up everything because of me. We made the right choice, Omega. But there are others out there who need our help. What sort of treachery is this? Stay back! us different. We make our own choices. What do you need, Rex? Any chance I could use you for a mission? Yeah, the tone and theme and vibe for season two is a lot of fun. We really see our team at a crossroads is sort of the starting point. And that had an effect on how we wrote the season and how we designed the characters to see them more beat up is really the vibe we were going for there. What are they going to do next? And it really carries through the, the way that the cast perform, the animation, lighting, music, final mix, all of it. We are going to see several new characters throughout season two. Um, some that we can't spoil, some that uh, people have seen throughout the trailer, such as uh, Commander Cody and Emperor Palpatine. Um, and of course, Captain Rex, who we saw in season one, also plays a, um, a part in season two. And they all are, in a sense, uh, vital to the path that the Bad Batch is taking throughout season two, which you know shifts a bit from, from season one. Yeah, the style of the Bad Batch season two um, is evocative of the Clone Wars, where we have a brushy texture to a lot of the surfaces. The way that we film these episodes um, is really more of a live action, has a live action sensibility for the type of lenses we use, the type of camera movement, movement we use, which is something that um, we're also carrying forward from Clone Wars in season one of the Bad Batch. Uh, and in season two, we look to push the fidelity just a little bit more of all of these things. At the beginning of season two, we find the Bad Batch a few, maybe six months uh, from the destruction of Topoka City. And uh, the, right now, the Empire thinks that they perished in the attack. So they are laying low, staying off the radar. They're a bit, you know, a bit more beaten up. Their armor's worn. Uh, they're going from gig to gig, just trying to sort of survive and make their way without making too many waves. But of course, because they're the bad batch and, and um, they always run into trouble and uh, and cause a scene, uh, they start to get um, more on the radar of the Empire as they become more involved in the things going on uh, throughout the galaxy. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we start the season, um, you know, not only uh, is, is a little bit of time passed, but the Bad Batch are essentially still doing missions for Sid uh, and trying to stay off of the Empire's radar because the Empire doesn't know that they're still alive. And the Bad Batch like that just fine. They want to make sure Omega's safe. They just want to just want to make their way through this galaxy in these very dark times. But um, some of the decisions that they make end up pulling them closer to the fire. And when we do that, the story really needed to become more serialized. So we start a little bit more ep episodic and we become more serialized. And they're both really 
um, all the way through the same story uh, from beginning to end affects our characters all the way, but it does become more serialized. I think my favorite character of season two is Crosshair. Um, based off of, you know, where we left him in season one and uh, the fact that he has doubled down with the Empire, I think he uh, is in, in the middle of a, um, of a, of a crisis and doesn't really understand where he fits in and uh, what the journey we take him on and his uh, connection with uh, Commander Cody. Uh, I think it's uh, it's some of my uh, favorite stuff, so. Yeah, and I'm gonna cheat because I have two favorite, I have so many favorite characters, but um, for for the Bad Batch, Omega, I just love seeing how she's she grows in the season, how she learns things, the way that, Michelle Ong performs her, all of the discussions we've had with Michelle. It's just such a great thing to see how she, um, you know, never, never gives up and has learned all these lessons. And she's this heart, has a heart of gold and is a guiding light for all of our team, but also cheating. Another answer, P. Genoa, new character <laughs> performed by Wanda Sykes. So fun to see how Omega reacts to her, to see how she interacts with the rest of the team. We think the fans are going to really like her. What can fans look forward to this season? Oh, I mean, an eclectic group of episodes that um, really take the team on a journey and put them through the ringer. And it's fun. Uh, there's a lot of heart in there. And, you know, the, the guest stars that we have really serve the story and, and propel it. And um, yeah, I mean, so much, so much <laughs> that I'm excited for. Yeah. This, this season, the action is, perhaps bigger i think the heart is deeper because the characters have grown and we see we get to learn more about them but yeah there there's a few episodes don't want to give anything away there's a few episodes that we think fans are going to really react to and it is a fun thing in this time period to bring in you know different parts of the star wars lore into the storyline which we think is really satisfying by the time you get to the end of the season Um, so I auditioned for a voice role, um, which was unusual because I am primarily a live action actor, um, but it was exciting because uh, I could use my natural accent. And at this point in time, I had no inkling that it was part of this amazing universe. Um, obviously, there was a code name and all the characters' names were changed. And then I got the call that I had landed the role and then the project was revealed to me. So that was pretty huge. Um, I was in New Zealand at the time and it kind of felt like it wasn't real and to be honest even though we've now completed season two it still semi feels like a dream. <laughs> I like that Omega is idealistic. I think because of her lack of experience of the darker parts of the world um, she's like a compass for questioning why things are being done the way that they are um I'm a little bit of an well I am an empath and I think I'm quite earnest and it's nice to be able to channel that into an a character that can can yeah can be in that sort of space on on the Star Wars universe uh well I knew that she was a lot younger when we first met her in season one um so it was really like um, you know, for my process, trying to imagine putting myself in the scene and as the character. So uh, because of Omega's really unique origin, it was really easy in the sense that anything that was outside Kamino in terms of a character, a planet, a texture was like, what is this? So um, I feel like that exuberance and wonder was sort of easy to access. It's quite interesting in season two, her voice changes a little bit. She, I, I don't have to sort of age down as much. Um, and we got to play with the um, a emotion that was a little more, I don't want to say petulant, uh, but like, you know, where she where she disagrees more and um, it gets a little fiery. And that was a new space as a voice actor for Omega to, yeah, for, for Omega to be, to be fleshed out. Um, oh, so many things. I think it, it really is the same thing of um, the naivete mixed with adolescence. So when she feels 
like something is wrong just the way that she delivers it as a matter of fact and also sometimes I think the New Zealandness of <clears throat> being quite um to the point sometimes and quite weirdly casual I always joke that New Zealanders have this uh <laughs> extremely casual way of talking about quite big things um and it works well in a sense with Omega's um age so quite often my offers in a record uh inspired by the Kiwi casualness and I think that lends quite a specificity to to Omega as a character uh yeah Omega has changed quite a bit since last we saw her it's been probably about six months so from a physical point of view she's older her hair's longer um she's also got a whole new outfit she's you know more appropriately <laughs> dressed for missions um and but that sort of that's like the physical stuff and internally she's just we see her as a very competent confident and um young bounty hunter that enjoys the adrenaline um you know she gets her kicks running away from giant crabs and <laughs> is very very good at marksmanship now she's she's a real ace with her bow um I think that sort of uh comfort and assuredness is a new a new vocal quality in her she's she's not meek or shy or questioning she's very much yep she's the good soldier and confident of her place in the squad well my initial involvement of star wars is when i was about 14 years old and i went and saw star wars <laughs> then the following halloween in 1977 my parents made me a jawa costume then the following uh, a summer, when Star Wars was re-released, re I was hired by a local cinema in my hometown of Greeley, Colorado, to be a Jawa all summer. <laughs> that was my start of Star Wars. <laughs> Flash forward about thirty years, and um, and they brought me in to audition for it. Dave Filoni um, uh, knew me uh, from working with him on Avatar, and so he knew me as an actor in a very different capacity. I auditioned for the role of the clones, and they arrived at me, and and off we went um, on something that um, I had no idea where this voyage would go, and I certainly wouldn't have ever thought of to, to cast myself in a straight-ahead soldier role. That wasn't the kind of stuff that I did, and it wasn't how I thought of myself. So it really, um, it really opened up how I how I see what I can do, and I, I've. I, I, I've been so, I, I just feel so very lucky to uh, to have this kind of creative um, challenge uh, that that is ongoing and it's so fun and and satisfying and fascinating. It's it's really cool. The main thing about keeping the characters distinct and the voices distinct is just to have a very clear idea of of who these guys are and and what the context of the scene that's playing out is. Fortunately, the writing, uh, uh, Jen Corbett and the team do a fantastic job with writing it and setting it all up. And so it's very clear who these guys are and what's playing out and how it needs to feel. And so um, we, we get to dive into everything from action to, to um, heartfelt one-to-one -to, -one, to heartbreak to, um, to tragedy to loss to overcoming to everything. Uh, it, with this whole range of emotion that you you don't always get the luxury of in a in a fantasy based action show, but as part of what's so satisfying about Star Wars is that all of this is so it's so detailed and so beautifully laid out in both an epic as well as a personal way um, that it's 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 a lot easier than you might think to to create these scenes uh, that we read through straight through just because. The painting is mostly painted by the time I get to speaking the words. Well, <laughs> the trick that I use is that if Wrecker is going to be yelling, I do that at the end of the session. That's my trick. <laughs> Other than that, I can pretty much go through the um, through the script, and it and it's usually not too damaging. If we have a lot of like yelling and screaming and that kind of stuff. We may uh, uh, save a few of those lines for the end of the session so that I still have enough gas in the tank vocally to, uh, to get us all the way through the mission without uh, too, much, um, too much hobbling around. 
But um, but that's basically it. That's basically it. I'm I'm old enough and experienced enough to know how how not to damage my voice and what not to do. Uh, earlier in my career, I don't think I would have known that. But now it's uh, part of the art of of doing something well is also avoiding things <laughs> that 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 work against you. You can buy your freedom. You can have a future. Isn't that what you're after? We're already free. Clearly, you're not paying attention to what's happening out there. It is time for a new era. Others out there who need our help. We'll take all the allies we can get. Let's go. Let's get to work.